In this final presentation on metabolism, we will focus on photosynthesis. Most of the energy on Earth comes directly or indirectly from the sun. Billions of years ago, some organisms figured out how to capture the energy of photons and convert it into an electrochemical gradient. Photosynthesis gave them a huge advantage and explains why they dominate the Earth. Want proof? Go outside anywhere except in a major city center and look around. Many of the organisms that you see will be plants. That won't be true in the winter. But did you know about half of the photosynthesis on Earth is done by microorganisms? Let's dive into the details. Here are the learning outcomes. What do all forms of photosynthesis have in common? First, they use light energy to make ATP and NADPH. Remember that these are the fuel that powers biosynthesis. Second, the energy yield of ATP is limited only by photons and the efficiency of light capture. If the sun is shining, these microbes can make ATP from it. Third, they use photophosphorylation to create a proton gradient across the membrane. ATP synthase then dissipates that gradient to synthesize ATP. As we go through the process, you will notice similarities to other respiratory chains we have covered. Fourth, the source of electrons can be from inorganic or organic compounds. Fifth, the photosynthetic apparatus uses light energy to boost the electron potential of the electrons. Sixth, the products of photosynthesis can be oxygen, sulfur, or sulfate. Finally, most photosynthetic microorganisms are capable of autotrophic growth. That is, the ability to synthesize all carbon compounds they need from carbon dioxide alone. Major functions in photosynthesis. To understand photosynthesis better, scientists divided the process into two broad areas. The light reactions, which require light, and the dark reactions, which don't. The light reactions use light harvesting pigments and proteins, pass the electrons through a membrane-bound electron transport chain, and generate ATP and NADPH. The dark reactions take the energy generated in the light reactions and use it to fix carbon dioxide into cell carbon. In this lecture, we're going to talk mostly about the light reactions. Here's the general scheme. The light harvesting proteins and pigments collect photons and funnel them to the reaction center. The reaction center contains a special pair, two molecules of chlorophyll. This chlorophyll contains magnesium ions, and that magnesium ion has an excitable electron. This electron gets its electron potential boosted by photons. The energized electron is ejected and then falls down an electron transport chain, generating a proton motive force. Knowing what you have already learned about electron transport, you can probably make a good guess at the path the electrons will take. Once they have traveled this course, many of the electrons make their way back to the reaction center, but others eventually end up on NADPH. Light harvesting complexes. This light energy, these photons, are collected by light harvesting complexes, LH. The number of photons available limits photosynthesis, and light harvesting complexes help maximize the amount of energy collected. You can think of them as giant antenna with a large surface area from which to collect light. Light harvesting complexes are made of protein and have pigments attached to them. These pigments include chlorophyll, bacterial chlorophyll, bacterial pheophyton, and carotenoids. Light harvesting complexes are highly ordered 2D arrays that hold the pigments in the perfect orientation for maximum photon collection. Shown here is the crystal structure of phycoerythrin, a light harvesting protein. Note the many light harvesting molecules, phycoerythrobilin, associated with the protein. 
Light harvesting complex is the sister reaction center in capturing photons. The photons the light harvesting complex collects are funneled towards the reaction center, which is located in the center of the complex. The reaction center then uses this light to energize an electron. Different photosynthetic bacteria absorb light at different wavelengths, and their protein and pigments dictate their absorption profile. For example, chlorophyll A, found in cyanobacteria in plants, has the absorption profile shown in green. Bacteria of chlorophyll A, found in purple bacteria, has the red absorption profile. These microbes compete for light, and you can see that it is an advantage for the purple bacteria, which are lower in the water column, to absorb a different wavelength, greater than 680 nanometers, to capture that energy, since the green chlorophyll A line is not absorbing that light energy. Light harvesting complexes also have carotenoids in their proteins. All carotenoids contain a long, unsaturated alkyl chain of 30 to 50 carbons with alternating double bonds. At the end will be 0, 1, or 2 cyclic rings. This structure results in a large array of p-orbital clouds that conjugate together. This property makes carotenoids very good at absorbing and dissipating high-energy electrons. Thus, these pigments serve a protective role. Let's dig into that protective role a little bit. This protective role is necessary. Carotenoids protect the reaction center from the triplet state of chlorophyll. If too much energy is focused on the reaction center, an electron in magnesium may jump to the triplet state. This energized electron in itself is not harmful, but if that electron gets passed to oxygen, it creates singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is very reactive and can destroy proteins, RNA, and DNA. Carotenoids can absorb these electrons from chlorophyll and prevent that damage. It can also quench singlet oxygen. In the reaction center, the carotenoid is positioned right next to the special pair of chlorophylls. The close proximity increases the likelihood that the carotenoid will react with the triplet state of chlorophyll and take the overly excited electron away from chlorophyll before it can do any damage. There is a wide variety of carotenoids present in bacteria with various structures. The variation in structure results in absorption of different wavelengths. Many other species have carotenoids to protect from oxidative damage. And speaking about positioning, the position of pigments is important in their roles in the cell. Light harvesting pigments are positioned near the outside of the membrane. This allows maximum light collection. The pigments in the reaction center are positioned to allow efficient transfer of light energy and the rapid transfer of electrons. If you look at the absorption maximum, pigments that absorb high energy short wavelength light are far away from the reaction center and transfer their energy to lower energy, longer wavelength light absorbing pigments. Thus, the light energy is traveling a downhill path to the reaction center. The reaction center. All of this light energy eventually arrives at the reaction center. The reaction center has pigments to absorb the light energy and molecules that are part of the electron transport chain. The center of it all is the special pair of chlorophyll that contains the magnesium atom that the photons excite. There are also the carotenoids that protect the process, other chlorophylls, bacterial pheophyton, non-heme iron, and quinones. All of the latter are involved in the electron transport chain. As you can see, this is a complex system. Let's go back to founding principles again. At a fundamental level, photosynthesis is powering orbital hopping. Photons hitting an atom cause the electron to jump from a lower orbital to a higher one, increasing its energy. Red photons, which have less energy, can excite an electron to a higher energy state. Still, 
Blue photons that have even more energy can excite electrons to an even higher energy state. Thus, the amount of light and its wavelength makes a difference on the excitation. We're going to use the purple bacteria of an example of energy conservation. This orbital hopping takes place at the reaction center at the magnesium in the center of the P870 special pair. Light boosts the electron state. This excited electron then travels down an electron transport chain. The energy of light is converted to an excited electron, which then powers the electron transport chain that in turn creates a proton gradient. We have now heard this story before, and ATP synthase finishes the conversion to chemical energy by using that proton gradient to power ATP synthase. Let's watch the process in action. So here are the players. We have a reaction center right here, B800, A850, B875, that all goes down to B870 here, right? And then in the reaction center, and then here's cytochrome BC1. Light excites the electron. It moves through bacterial chlorophyll, bacterial pheophyton, then quinones. Produce quinone, then travels to the membrane and interacts with cytochrome BC1, where protons are pumped across the membrane. Finally, the spent electrons are transferred back to the reaction center by cytochrome C2. This figure shows the actual movement of electrons through the reaction center. Green is a special pair of chlorophylls, yellow is the bacterial pheophyton, brown is the iron, and blue is the quinone. To summarize, the essential parts of the photosynthetic system are a light harvesting complex that collects light for photosynthesis by use of photopigments, a source of electrons. We've not talked much about this yet, but we will when we cover the specifics of each group of organisms. A reaction center where the light collects and causes the excitation of a bacterial chlorophyll molecule resulting in the ejection of an excited electron. An electron transport chain that spends the energy of this excited electron to create a proton gradient. ATP synthase that makes ATP. And finally, an exit pathway for the electrons that results in the reduction of NADP to NADPH. We now turn to looking at different photosynthetic systems in bacteria. In your biology class, you learned about plant photosynthesis but that is not the only photochemistry in the natural world. Photosynthesis can be anoxygenic, meaning it doesn't generate oxygen. These photosynthetic bacteria will use many different sources of electrons. Three subgroups in this category are purple bacteria, green bacteria, and heliobacteria. Photosynthesis can also be oxygenic, meaning it generates oxygen. This is the type of photosynthesis you have already learned about. It uses water as its source of electrons. The cyanobacteria and algae perform oxygenic photosynthesis. In the rest of this lecture, we will get into the specifics of these different systems to give you examples of how photosynthesis works in microorganisms. One common group of photosynthetic bacteria are the purple bacteria. They are found in freshwater and marine environments and form gram-negative rods or spirilla. All of them are members of the alpha, beta, or gamma proteobacteria. The images show examples such as Rhodomicrobium vanellii, Rhodopseudomonas acidophila, and Rhodopseudomonas palustris. The physiology of the purple bacteria. When performing photosynthesis, they can use a wide variety of electron donors, including hydrogen sulfide, hydrogen gas, and organic acids, such as malate or succinate. If they use hydrogen sulfide or other sulfur compounds, they will oxidize them to sulfur or sulfate. They obtain their carbon from carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, or organic acids. By the way, that's right. These bacteria can obtain carbon from something that is poisonous to humans, carbon monoxide. On the right is examples of purple non-sulfur bacteria group 
in isolation medium. We actually grew these out of Lake Mendota. The purple non-sulfur bacteria as a group are amazingly versatile in their metabolism. As an example, Rhodospirillum rubrum is capable of growing under the various conditions listed in this table. It can grow photoautolithotrophically, photoheteroorganotrophically, or chemoheteroorganotrophically. This versatility makes them ideal for studying in the laboratory. If you look at the last row on the table, you realize our rubrin and other purple non-sulfur bacteria can grow without photosynthesis. Thus, mutations in genes needed for photosynthesis are not lethal to the microbe, opening them up for extensive genetic analysis. This is not true for most other classes of bacteria or plants that can grow by photosynthesis. Mutations in the photosynthetic genes of most other organisms are lethal to that organism. Light harvesting. We use the light harvesting system of the purple non-sulfur bacteria as our example previous. Their photosystem is housed in an intracytoplasmic membrane, shown in the little photo on the right. And in an ICM is an infolding of the membrane of the bacterium. They create this extra surface area to house the large number of light harvesting complexes needed to carry out photosynthesis. There are two protein complexes in purple bacteria, a core system that is always present at a fixed ratio of nine complexes per reaction center and a peripheral light harvesting complex whose number varies depending upon the light intensity. Under low light conditions, more peripheral LHCs are formed Per reaction center. The reaction center consists of three polypeptides, a heavy, medium, and light chain. Bound to the M and L chains are one carotenoid, two bacterial chlorophylls, two bacterial feed phyton, one non-heme iron, one tightly held quinone, and one freely dissociable quinone. The freely dissociable quinone is the one that escapes the reaction center after being reduced and it interacts with cytochrome BC1 complex. Up until this point, we have described how photosynthetic bacteria make a proton gradient in ATP. But for biosynthesis, they also need reducing power in the form of NADPH. During autotrophic growth, purple bacteria generate NADPH from their cyclic electron transport chain. However, there is a problem. Electrons on quinones only have an electron potential of 100 milli electron volts. Under standard conditions, they do not have enough electron potential to reduce NADPH, which has an electron pen potential of negative 320 milli electron volts. What does the microbe do? It stops making ATP. This increases the size of the reduced quinone pool, changing the equilibrium and making it favorable to reduce NADPA to NADPH. We now move on to the green bacteria, a second group of bacteria that have a different photochemistry. The green bacteria are gram-negative rods, but are obligate phototrophs. They are capable of performing photosynthesis under low light conditions and their light harvesting complex, the chlorosome, makes this possible. Unlike the purple bacteria, which are distributed throughout the proteobacteria, green bacteria form a phylogenetically distinct group. They are not closely related to any other photosynthetic bacteria. Here we will focus on the green sulfur bacteria because the most is known about them. There are dozens of species. Here are a few examples. Chlorobium limacola, the bright white globules are sulfur. Chlorobium pheovibroides. Posticochlorus acetuari and Pelodictyon clarathiformi. But yeah, as you can see, there's all sorts of different interesting shapes and sizes. Green sulfur bacteria are strict anaerobes and obligate phototrophs. All green bacteria can use hydrogen sulfide as an electron donor 
and some are capable of using hydrogen gas or thiol sulfate. Light harvesting. Their light harvesting complex is unusual. It is an elliptical structure just under the cytoplasmic membrane. Inside the light harvesting complex is a crystalline array of bacterial chlorophyll C that is surrounded by a lipid membrane with no protein. This array is highly efficient at collecting light and funneling it to the base plate, which then passes the photons on to the reaction center. The chlorosome is a highly efficient light collector and green bacteria specialize in living in environments of very low light, yet still being able to photosynthesize. The reaction center. The reaction center of green bacteria contains a core polypeptide and a light harvesting protein. There is bacterial chlorophyll, a C-type cytochrome, and iron sulfur proteins. The flow of electrons to the reaction center is still somewhat controversial, but a general idea of its likely path can be presented. So here are the players in the process. The excited electron is donated to bacterial chlorophyll A, then to an iron sulfur center. At this point, there are two possible paths the electron can flow. In the cyclic path, electrons are donated to the diffusible quinone, which then joins the quinone pool. The quinone pool reacts with cytochrome BC1 and generates a proton gradient, similar as to what's described in the metabolism, chap metabolism chapter and what we just described for the purple bacteria. Cytochrome C54 then shuttles these electrons from cytochrome BC1 back to the special pair in the reaction center, closing the loop. The second path involves donation of electrons either to iron sulfur A or iron sulfur B and the subsequent reduction of NADH. The fact that these iron sulfur centers have higher reduction potentials than the quinone pool in purple bacteria allows the green sulfur bacteria that use this path to create ATP and NADH without the use of reverse electron flow. We now cover our last group of photosynthetic bacteria, the cyanobacteria. They are ubiquitous in the environment. Deserts, tropical rainforests, lakes, oceans, and even thermal hot springs will have these organisms. Pictured on the slide is Octopus Spring at Yellowstone. If you sample the waters at 75 degrees, you will find thermophilic cyanobacteria, a syncococcus species, growing just fine. I find that amazing. Cyanobacteria are one of the most successful species on Earth. They are obligate phototrophs and perform plant-like oxygenic photosynthesis. Although, laboratory experiments have shown slow growth as photoheterotrophs in some strains, cyanobacteria form a tight phylogenetic group. Light harvesting. Their photosynthetic machinery is present in thycoloid membranes. These are packed with light harvesting complexes as shown in the figure. The light harvesting proteins are called phycobilly proteins, with three being known, phycoerythrin that absorbs at 550 nanometers, phycocyanin that absorbs at 620 nanometers, and allophycocyanin that absorbs at 650 nanometers. The types of proteins found in the LHC depend upon the species. Shown here is an example of a cyanobacterial light harvesting complex from Syncococcus. The phycobilisome in Syncococcus is relatively simple, containing phycocyanin and allophycocyanin as light harvesting pigments. Having high energy light collected at the outside allows transfer of that energy to internal light harvesting proteins and eventually to the reaction center. The reaction center. The reaction centers in cyanobacteria are the most complex. They actually have two reaction centers, photosystem one and photosystem two. If you compare DNA sequence of the genes that encode the reaction centers between PS1, PS2, green and purple bacteria, you find that there is significant homology between PS1 to the green reaction center and PS2 to the purple reaction center. There are differences in the chemistry, but many similarities. Electrons come from water, and PS2 contains a manganese peroxidase, which can split water into protons, 
electrons, and oxygen. The enzyme in PS2 that splits water is the most powerful oxidizer on Earth. These electrons have their energy boosted by the P680 special pair and end up on a quinone, similar to what happens in purple bacteria light reactions. The electrons are then donated to PS1. The P700 special pair on PS1 then boosts the electrons a second time. Just as in green bacteria, the electrons can cycle through the cytochrome BF complex, or they can be used to reduce NADP to NADPH. So they have a possible, so they can generate as much ATP as they need by just cycling through the cytochrome BF complex, or they can then make more NADPH, more reducing power if they need it. Okay, you'll notice it's more complex. There's more proteins in it, photosystem one, photosystem two, plus the cytochrome BR complex, right? And if you follow through, right, there goes into PS2. Looks very similar to what happened in the purple bacteria. This gets donated to the cytochrome BF, but then ends up on photosystem one. It can then go through that. Again, the electrons can end up on a quinone, and this is showing the cyclic photosynthesis, or the electrons can go through and go through these enzymes and then end, eventually end up on NADPH. Regulation in cyanobacteria. My cyanobacteria while cyanobacteria are obligate phototrophs, some can still alter pigments produced based on the wavelength and intensity of light that they receive. The composition of the phycobilisome will change. More phycoerythrin is expressed in red light and more phycocyanin in blue light. Also, if the bacterium is starving, it will degrade its phycobilisomes to free cell carbon for other purposes. Examining these structures makes it tempting to draw some reasonable deductions about how photosynthesis evolved on Earth. You first have to have the creation of the purple and green photosynthetic apparatus. These then combine at some point in one organism. This combination may have been by horizontal gene transfer. We'll talk more about that later in the semester, but what that means is like the whole genetic apparatus, all the genes involved in purple photosynthesis was transferred into a green bacteria. Or it could be by a symbiosis between two photosynthetic microbes, a green bacteria and a purple bacteria, and eventually they merged. Eventually this evolved into the first cyanobacteria. And we have talked about the story from here. You have symbiosis of a cyanobacteria with a protozoan that then becomes an endosymbiosis then you get a photosynthetic protozoa and eventually a multicellular plant. One more thing before I end this video. There is another light-driven energy production system, retinal-based phototrophy. This system is a way to make ATP from light, but it does not depend upon reaction centers or chlorophyll. It was first discovered in a halophilic archaea, Unlike photosynthesis or apparati with their dozens of proteins and pigments, it only involves a single protein and a single pigment, retinal. Subsequent work in microbial ecology has discovered that retinal-based phototrophy is widespread. One thing I want to emphasize, which many students confuse when they first learn about this system, retinal-based phototrophy is not photosynthesis. It is a light-driven way to make ATP, but you cannot make reducing power from this system. It is not photosynthesis. Do not confuse that. The system is pretty simple. Light hits retinal, causing a conformational change in the pigment that results in the movement of a proton from the inside to the outside of the cellular membrane. As usual, the creation of a proton gradient is dissipated by ATP synthase to make ATP. That brings us to the end of our lecture on phototrophy and on the lectures on metabolism in general. 
Metabolism is the heart of life on Earth and the cornerstone of microbial diversity. It is amazing how microorganisms have found hundreds and hundreds of different ways to make a living.